Bonjour, FCM. How's it going, FCM? Hope you're doing all right. Hello, FCM. I'm not sure if you're applauding me or the fact that the event is now wrapping up and you get to go out and enjoy the nice day. Uh, that's me. Okay, thank you. I wasn't sure. Uh, thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Rebecca. I just want to say, c'est vraiment un grand honneur pour moi. De... It's really a big honor to be here with you, to come and uh, and uh, uh, meet with FCM and to to share a few words. Uh, to, to attend FCM, I think it's such an important thing, and I hope by attending, you you see in that my commitment to working with the municipalities and recognizing, as was said by your new president, congratulations to the new president, that it is a full order of government and you've got lots of responsibilities and you need the support to be able to deliver what your citizens, you know, the people that live in your communities need. Donc, vous pouvez compter sur moi. So you can count on me uh, as an ally for working together so that you can continue your important work in your communities to improve uh, these important services. Thank for the opportunity. And I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Thank you very much for being here, of course. So I have a few questions, and we can have a bit of a discussion um, around those questions. So Mr. Singh, the wildfires uh, crisis in Alberta is a stark and all too common reminder of the hazards facing Canadians as a result of extreme weather made worse by the effects of a changing climate. As you know, FCM has long advocated for tools like the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund to help local government prepare for a future where these kinds of weather events are more common. In the most recent federal budget, municipalities didn't see the scale of investment that we know is needed to really address the challenge before us in building more resilient communities. While we acknowledge the scale of the support required, we see it is an investment in communities that are better able to withstand the next flood, wildfire, ice storm, and more. So my question is this, what approach can we expect from the NDP when it comes to working with other parties in Ottawa to ensure Canada's communities are better protected against weather extremes? And second part, what are you hearing from Canadians across the country on this issue? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I'd say that we're, we're facing particularly challenging times where on top of extreme weather becoming more and more common, everyone is feeling the squeeze of the cost of everything going up. They're feeling squeezed because of the cost of groceries up. It's hard to find a place you can afford. And on top of that, we're getting into a period of time where that extreme weather, the hot, dry climate that we're not as used to in many parts of the country. I know in the lower mainland, heat waves are not something that anyone would, would have imagined in the past, but it's becoming more and more the reality. And that means more and more fires, forest fires that are burning longer. We're also seeing such extremes where in the exact same community, we know in, in um, Northwest Territories, we're seeing at the exact same time record forest fires, but also flooding. So you've got extreme weather hitting both ways in similar communities. It's really, really difficult. So I'm hearing a lot of people saying, it doesn't really make any sense that we're seeing a big response after the fact, after that crisis hits. I was speaking with folks in, in Northwest Territories, in Northern Saskatchewan, speaking with local municipal leaders, and they're saying, we appreciate people offering us help now, but what actually benefit us a lot more is if we had the disaster mitigation to prevent the crises that we could avoid and actually build more resilient communities so that we wouldn't have to respond to a crisis. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it's a smarter investment. It's always better if we can be proactive rather than being reactive. And so we're absolutely in favor of a disaster mitigation fund, one that's easy to use, one that's accessible, and one that helps municipalities build up the infrastructure they need to be resilient because of the more and more common extreme weather, whether that's infrastructure for water to prevent flooding or that's infrastructure to prevent the spread of a forest fire. We need to in invest in advance proactively and we'll be fighting for that in Parliament. You can count on us for sure. Thank you very much. So let's talk about the future of infrastructure in Canada. And we know that with Canada's current and future growth comes a critical need for municipal foundations to be secured. We know we need more housing, for example, but more and better housing depends on core infrastructure, such as water and wastewater water systems, accessible and equitable uh, public transit, roads, community buildings, and more. 
FCM has consistently called on the federal government to collaborate with municipalities to design and deliver the next generation of infrastructure in Canada. Our goal is simple, making sure that Canada's infrastructure meets the local needs of Canadians in a way that they can see and use every day. What can you tell us about your party's vision for infrastructure investment? Where do you see the key priorities right now? And what is your approach to working with all orders of government to get it done? I think it's such a, such a relevant question. We, we know we need housing. There's no question about it. I think the most unifying single challenge that our country is faced with is housing, whether it's rent or whether it's buying your first home. It is a massive challenge. But at the same time, like you all know, it is very difficult to build the housing that communities need if the infrastructure is not there. And that means more than just the housing, it also means the way for people to get around, so transit, of course. Uh, water, actually, is a really important one. We know a lot of communities are getting to that point where their water infrastructure is getting to the end of life. And we're seeing a lot of municipalities that are saying, we have no means, there is no way for us to ever be able to afford the changes we need to make to make sure our infrastructure is up to speed, particularly when it comes to water and waste. And that is an area where the federal government's got to step up and, and provide support. So there's a lot of areas. The big difference between our approach as New Democrats and the current approach of the government is the government's really relying a lot on the infrastructure bank and a lot of private investment. We have seen so far that that hasn't worked. The infra infrastructure bank hasn't delivered a lot of projects. So we want to see direct public investment and take it seriously, not just hope for an investor to come in, but we build publicly, we own it publicly, and we deliver the services that communities need. But back to the housing point, I just want to finish. I know this is about broadly speaking, but infrastructure, we need to build all the infrastructure, whether it's looking at telecommunications as infrastructure, looking at our electri electrical grid, and connecting communities that don't have low carbon electricity with those, those provinces that do. There's a lot of infrastructure investment, but on the housing front, I want to point out that we, we need to build, and we need to build fast, and we need to build everywhere. All communities need housing. And instead of kind of slogans that are attacking municipalities or mayors, uh, which we've seen some folks kind of throw in these slogans of, of red tape or gatekeepers, uh, I'm actually focused on delivering real concrete things. So we push for the rapid housing initiative. Uh, that was something that communities said worked. We push for that. We also push for a housing accelerator fund, which is a real usable fund that's going to be helpful for municipalities to access to build more housing quickly. We want to look for real solutions, and we know it's going to require a mix of things. We, of course, have to incentivize and support private development, but we also need to look at non-market housing because a lot of people could never afford market housing. And so we have to look at a, a range of housing options and not think about one solution only because the problem is so diverse. We need to look at it as a, a whole problem and then have multiple solutions to deal with it. Thank you. Let's move to uh, a discussion on homelessness. So in recent summer seasons across Canada, uh, we have seen an increased visibility of encampments uh, sheltering people experiencing homelessness. And it is a crisis that is present and immediate in communities of all sizes right across the country. Cities and communities are responding day in and day out, often with limited resources, by acting with compassion and giving the public as much confidence as possible that these situations are being managed. And the truth is that all orders of government need to work together to address the challenge of chronic homelessness. It is critical that provincial and federal fu funding both address the rising prevalence of homelessness as well as the growing cost of wraparound support services that help mitigate the pattern too many Canadians face of returning to homelessness even after finding help. How can FCM work with you and the NDP caucus to help communities as they do the hard work of ending chronic homelessness in Canada? Uh, it's a really serious problem across our country. Uh, on a personal note, I, I lived through a, a period of time when we lost our housing as a family and we were in this moment of not knowing where we we're going to live. And if anyone's ever been in a situation where you don't know where you're going to live, it is probably one of the scariest things. It is one of the scariest things to not know where you're going to keep a roof over your head. And I was the eldest, so the response to me was on me. And I remember calling up relatives to say, hey, we need a place. And, and some of our relatives were also in a bit of a tough bind. And they had to say no to me. And, and it was heartbreaking for me to hear that. I'm sure it was tough for them. But I had to figure out a way to take care of my kid brother and my sister 
and my mom and dad, and it was a tough thing. So uh, housing is the most important thing, I think, in someone's life. And that's why I really believe in the housing first as an approach. It's something where we look at, there's a lot of things that people need. Sometimes people need, if they're dealing with homelessness, there might be other issues in addition to economic insecurity. It might be mental health, might be addictions. But instead of looking at it like, let's fix the addiction or let's deal with the mental health, people have said that the evidence is showing that if we approach it with a housing first solution, get people housed, everything else is more doable. Getting someone uh, the supports they need if they have a home, getting someone uh, supports to get a job. If you've got a home, it's really the starting point to deal with all the challenges in your life. And having had some of that precarity in my life, I really believe in that. So uh, housing first has got to be our approach. Find ways to get people housed as quickly as possible. That's why the Rapid Housing Initiative is one that makes a lot of sense. As I mentioned, there are a lot of reasons why people end up in a situation of homelessness. So we need a lot of solutions. Multiple re causes requires multiple solutions. And I mentioned some of them. So some of it might be because of economic precarity. Some of it is because of addictions or mental health issues. So we need to provide those services as well. The other thing I think is often missed is that to prevent people to get to that point in the first place, we need to keep the affordable housing we do have. In a lot of communities, what is affordable is the first to go. I was just in London, Ontario, and there are a community there that live in, the, in a housing that's really affordable. They're paying about seven, the seniors are paying $700 a month, $900 a month for a two bedroom, 700 for a one bedroom. There, that building was purchased by a, a large company that wants to rent evict everybody, and they're proposing to double or triple the rent to $1,800. And folks are saying, we're gonna go homeless if that happens. We can't afford that, we're on fixed incomes. So we need to keep the housing that is affordable and then build a whole lot more. Thank you. So yesterday, uh, moving on to um, mental health. Uh, yesterday, FCM's membership overwhelmingly supported a resolution urging the federal government to take action on the growing crisis of mental health. Municipalities are on the front line of this challenge, increasingly supporting mental health in communities by providing essential services such as social and community programming, supportive housing, community outreach and engagement, and substance use and addiction support services. All the while, often falling short due to insufficient resources and funding, limited access to the mental health services and supports that are needed, and dramatically increasing demand at the same time. So while health has traditionally been the domain of the provinces, it is simply the reality that municipalities are expected to respond first and do more. Can municipalities count on the NDP support in our call for the federal government to lead the creation of an intergovernmental platform for mental health and to develop a comprehensive mental health strategy that recognizes the interconnectedness of this challenge with the twin crises of homelessness and substance use disorder? Direct answer, yes, of course, absolutely. Um, it's mental health and substance abuse is something that also hits really close to home. My, my dad actually struggled with, with an addiction. And it meant the reason why I was in that precarious situation with housing was because my dad lost his work because of an addiction. And if you've ever had someone in your life, someone dear to you that's dealing with an addiction, there's this one window of opportunity. And it happened to my dad when he'd been hospitalized for the third time in maybe as many months. And the physicians were saying, basically, you, you are going to die. Like, if you don't deal with this addiction, you're going to die. And we'd known that for his whole life, that this is something very serious, and he didn't take it seriously because the addiction itself is one of those things that makes you not really think about the reality that you're up against. And for some reason, at one point, he hit a point where he said, I want to live. And we scrambled to find a place for him to get help. And at that point, we didn't have much resource. My dad was a physician at one point, earning a very good salary, had good coverage. And at that point, had not been working for about a decade, had no uh, private insurance anymore. And so we scrambled to find a place that would have a bed for him. And by sheer luck, there was a publicly funded facility that had in-house uh, treatment that he could stay at that had a bed available. We called around, we found it. I remember driving him there and he was so hopeful, even though he was so frail, and he got that help that he needed. And now he's uh, in his 70s and he's a very successful psychiatrist, uh, treating lots of patients. But he wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that publicly funded 
bed that was available. And so I really believe in mental health being a part of our healthcare system. We gotta treat it like it's a healthcare issue. People need to have access, they need to have public access. It shouldn't be about who can afford it or not. I couldn't afford it at the time, my dad couldn't afford it. And now he's contributing back as a physician, as a psychiatrist. So I really believe in it. Municipalities cannot do it alone. You're being asked to do so much, you can't do it alone. So we've got to step up and, and treat, this, treat this really seriously. We could save lives, we can improve the lives of communities, keep people healthier, and having gone through it personally, I know how life-changing it can be if the services are there and are available. So I'm gonna fight for that. Well, thank you so much for sharing your lived experience and also for your support in that effort. Of course. Of course. <laughs> the last question I have for you uh, is around fiscal framework. So as we've covered, municipal leaders are driving local action on homelessness, housing, mental health, and addictions, as well as sustainability and climate adaptation. But these challenges are drawing more and more on municipal resources within a fiscal framework never designed to handle this kind of demand. And as Canada grows, so too does the demand. Cities and municipalities have had to take on new responsibilities with respect to health, social services, housing, and economic development. And long-standing city responsibilities like policing and waste management, water, wastewater management are becoming more complex due to the challenges linked to mental health, homelessness, and, uh, and climate change. Yesterday, our membership also adopted a resolution giving MC FCM the mandate to call on the federal government to engage FCM in the development of a municipal growth framework through a process by which new sources of municipal revenue are proposed, evaluated, and implemented. Can FCM and our members count on the NDP support for this national conversation around new municipal growth framework? I, I love the straightforward uh, question, so I can just say a strong yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but to elaborate, yes, we, we actually push for it in a concrete way. So, we understand how the formerly known as the gas, it's almost like the prince, right? Formerly known as the artist, formerly yeah. known as the gas tax, now known as a community building fund. Uh, we know that you've been requesting it to be doubled and to be made permanent. We agree. That is one tool that needs to be there. So yes, absolutely. So some good and bad news. Good news, we pushed hard and it is, it is remaining doubled, but it's not been made permanent. And we know that Municipalities need the sustainability of knowing that that funding is there. There's limited options for municipalities and there's, like you mentioned, more and more needs. And those needs are gonna grow with population growth. And really municipalities only really have property taxes, their main source uh, of revenue. But the services, there's no end to all the services provided. And we've seen in many jurisdictions the, the downloading of additional services that used to be covered provincially just means it's harder and harder. So we absolutely believe that it needs to be ongoing stable funding. We are open to finding ways to do that. One of the things that would help, I'm sure, is to make the doubling of the, the community building fund permanent and then have at least that foundation of support. But we're open to looking at other sources of revenue. We know that you need it and we know that the needs are so high and the demand is only growing for their services. So we wanna be strong partners in finding a way to give municipalities the actual tools so they can thrive. I think you can thrive and you are thriving, but you're thriving with a lot of MacGyver, figuring out ways to come up with solutions. And I wanna make it so you're not having to spend all that creative energy on MacGyvering solutions, but actually have the, the sustainable funding to continually build what your communities need. The MacGyver reference only worked, I feel like, in this crowd. I've used that in other crowds, and, and no one watched the show. No one knows what I'm talking about. Uh, but I grew up on that, so yes. I got a dub, lots of thumbs up for MacGyver, so that's good. People get the reference. Appreciate that. Uh, so thank you so much for those comments. And you're right, there's a lot of energy and ideas in this room, and we've seen that over the past few days during the annual conference. And we have uh, overwhelming support by the membership to take this to board discussions in the coming year. Um, and so there are ideas. We don't know what it looks like yet. Um, and we're really appreciative that you're open to hearing from us on that issue. 
Um, those are all the questions that I have, but let me just say that um, it's a, a real um, honor that you continue to prioritize partnering with the SCM um, and its members, and um, there are continuously strong alignment around some of our goals and what matters to us as um, municipalities, small communities, local governments, um, from coast to coast to coast, as we like to say. So thank you very much for coming and speaking with us today, and we look forward to continued partnership in the coming year. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you all. Hope you have a great day in Toronto.